This is the Human Action Podcast with your hosts, Jeff Deist and Dr. Bob Murphy. Welcome back, everybody. It is another episode of the Human Action Podcast, joined this week by a great friend of ours, Daniel McAdams from the Ron Paul Institute. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with his work and with his Liberty Report, which he does every day with Dr. Paul at 11 o'clock central on YouTube, which you should definitely check out. And as always, my co-host, Dr. Bob Murphy, is with us. And so we thought we couldn't ignore the news of the week, which has a lot of economic impact on the world, which is basically the sabotage or blowing up or destruction of the new Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline, which travels, of course, directly from Russia, from the former Soviet Union into Germany. And Daniel, I'm struck as uh, I was you know, going through my Twitter feed last night, going through the news, there's all this information out there. It wasn't that long ago we thought that the digital age and the internet was going to make it easier for us to uh, explain world events to everybody, and there would be less Im- misinformation. But I see people like former CIA Director Brennan, I see uh, the U.S. Pentagon officials, I see all kinds of people mouthing off as to, as to how and why this happened and whom caused it. So what are your thoughts on, on you know, what's happening here? Well, I think one of the reasons it's difficult is that the whole operation was done with the idea of plausible deniability. Um, Now, plausible deniability, you know, if you want to go back 20 or 30 years, was different in the pre-digital world. But now we have things like geolocation of U.S. military vessels, of U.S. flight pattern, military flight patterns, of the specific types of helicopters that were circling around the area where the explosions occurred, of the military operations that were taking place literally on that island that was just a few kilometers from when the for where the attacks occurred. Um, now this is circumstantial evidence, but we know now, thanks to the digital age, that the U.S. was military has been in the area with a, a military operation specializing in blowing stuff up overseas. So if I'm Poirot and I'm looking around at motive, well gee, the president of the U.S. said, we're going we're gonna to do this. Um, uh, the architect of the coup in 2014, Victoria Newland, is on tape saying, we're going to stop this. You get the military there that specializes in blowing stuff overseas, up under sea. They were there uh, at the same time. Uh, then, you know, it's, it's, again, you know, we're all sitting here on the, on, the, on the train car in the Orient Express trying to figure out who did it or something. So um, we don't know for sure, but circumstantial evidence it certainly, you know, p- points very strongly in that direction. Bob, do you have any thoughts about how serious this is for the European energy markets? We hear a lot about, you know, it's going to be winter soon. Uh, what does this mean? Well, well, sure. And just to piggyback on what uh, Daniel was saying there, I mean, these are obvious points, but in a lot of, like you're saying, Jeff, in a lot of the analysis, people are, oh, this is Russia. Why would they do that? And the, the, so heinous. But again, just real basic facts here, just to make sure, you know, we we don't forget to say this stuff that, you know, what was the situation is the U.S. was leading to have sanctions on Russian exports and, and the U.S. You know, has plenty of natural gas and there's huge stockpiles in Canada as well. So don't, you know, for, in case folks don't know that, like the environmentalist dogma, that's totally wrong. There's not like for centuries of current consumption levels, the U.S. is fine in terms of if, if the U.S. government would allow Americans to use what we have here. So the U.S. is fine. And then and so they wanted to have a total like bl- blockade or, you know, just cut them off. But they made concessions. If you guys remember, you know, Biden was saying, now our European allies are more dependent. And, and so that's why, you know, we, we cut them some slack. They got to still use it. So in terms of the situation, the U.S. didn't want Russia to export. If Russia wanted to stop sending natural gas, they could just turn the spigot off. They don't need to blow up the pipeline. That doesn't make any sense. And why would they do it clandestinely? Why wouldn't they show, hey, you guys are going to you know, mess with us? Well, then we're going to shut off the natural gas. So why would they be secret about it? They'd be like a mob boss saying, look at me. I did this to you. Right. That's that would be the whole point. So I haven't seen anyone explain if Russia did do it. Why didn't they just turn off the tap? Why would they blow the thing up? And then they can't. There's in other words, there's no leverage. Like you could say, we're turning this off until you guys give us our demands or whatever. And then we'll turn it back on. So blowing it up is kind of goofy. What makes total sense, though, is the country that wanted the sanctions but made some concessions because their allies were more dependent if they did it clandestinely, because then, you know, they could say, well, we didn't do that because that would look very aggressive and be spudding the European. So to answer your question, yeah, they were very heavily dependent, Germany especially, before all this happened. 
And now, I mean, what? why do you have a, a pipeline in place? It's because that's a, the cheapest way to get the, the gas from, you know, Russia to where it needs to go. So now, even if things went back to normal, it would be a huge hassle to come up with other ways to, to route it through there, right? So that's that's part of the issue. Another big picture element here, just in terms of the logistics, it's easier to ship crude oil in terms of like energy density, you know, natural, it's a gas. And so that's why when the U.S. has exports now to Germany and, and the rest of Europe, they have to liquefy it. And, and that's part of the bottleneck that it's hard to take, you know, the gas turn into liquid, get it on ships and across the ocean. So again, this is why pipelines are so valuable. And yes, this is obviously going to be a, a huge deal. That's why they were so dependent on that pipeline in the first place, because it kept prices lower. But we also think that a it's not just oil that flows through pipelines. A lot of our internet and communications and banking takes place via underseas pipelines. So it's disturbing if we think about that. It's not just satellites these days. You know, a lot of our emails and other things travel. So if the if we can start blowing things up, uh, you know, what does that portend? Is it how will Europe get the oil and natural gas it needs this winter? So let me just make a point, too, before I forget that they're trying to blame everything on Putin. There was a full blown energy crisis and people and not just like hysterical people, but regular analysts, serious analysts, energy analysts were saying in Europe there was an energy crisis as of last fall. Right. So several months ahead of the invasion, just to give some statistic in the summer of 2021, natural gas prices in Europe were 600 percent higher than they had been 12 months earlier. OK, so this again, the summer of 2021, that was the case. And electricity prices in the UK and Germany and other places were more than double than they had been a year earlier. So a little bit of that was the bounce back just from the, you know, the pandemic lockdown lows as economic activity resumed. But again, some of these things were just you see the charts and they're just off the off the chart, literally. And so some of that was they had carbon pricing schemes in place. You know, they, they jacked up the, the price of carbon allowances in the European trading system for those things. They had uh, Germany in particular had a lot of stringent limits on, you know, fossil fuels and all these programs to try to encourage renewable energy. So all that stuff was in place. They had a full blown energy crisis way before Putin did anything. And so it's convenient for environmentalists to now be able to just blame everything on Putin because this stuff was happening well before that. So to answer your question, they're doing a combination of things. I mean, they, as I'm sure many of the listeners know, they have schemes in place now to severely uh, ration energy usage where neighbors are ratting on each other. You know, oh, if you see somebody who's got their thermostat set too high in the, in the winter, call this hotline, you know, things like that. In the U.S., you see stuff like if there's a water shortage and then your neighbor, if you see him water in the mm -hmm. lawn, call in. Mm -hmm. They have stuff like that in Europe, in certain regions right now for just energy usage. So they're going to do things like that and wear a lot of sweaters, I guess. But crude oil can flow anywhere, right? In other words, if energy prices spike in Europe, presumably uh, oil and natural gas would begin to flow in that direction from sources around the world. It's not just Russian gas and oil that's available to us. So uh, well, wouldn't that affect us as American consumers ultimately? Oh, oh, sure. So and that's why I was making the point earlier. It's easier, like crude oil it can more easily be rearranged it, or more economically because it's the energy density you know, per cubic volume or however you want to measure it. And, and so, yes, if, if crude oil prices spike in Europe, it's easier for the U.S. to like ship that over. And then that, you know, the market, global markets want to have some of an equilibrium adjusting for sh shipping cost. So, yes, the U.S. You know, prices would rise here as well. But what I'm saying is there was a a huge disparity in natural gas prices. And part of that was because to get natural gas from here where the price is low over there where the price is really high, you have to liquefy it. And it's, it's a bigger process and just the, the plants and, and uh, you know, the guys I know on insiders are saying, as you can guess, the Biden administration was not green lighting, you know, more pipelines to get stuff from our wells okay. to the liquefaction plants, what, you know, which is a necessary step in the process. So lots of, hindrances but yeah of course it's going to affect us yes if prices are sky high there it tends to raise them around the world people through black markets and other means or through countries that aren't going along with the sanctions buy up the access there and that raises the price in the other regions where technically they're allowed to have an open market daniel i guess my question for you is if the u.s government is in fact engineering or exacerbating an energy crisis i mean how first of all how does that hurt putin does it 
perversely actually end up helping him in the long run. Second of all, does that help or hurt this push for a Green New Deal? I mean, it, if people, it might have the opposite effect in that people begin to see how vitally important oil and natural gas is to our, you know, our day-to-day lives. Well, here's how the attack hurts Russia, if that's the intent. They lost about a half a billion dollars worth of natural gas. And certainly at this point, when you're trying to prosecute a pretty serious and expanding war, you don't necessarily want to blow a half a billion dollars, particularly when their entire military budget is something like $67 billion a year. So they've blown that. They've blown a multi-billion dollar pipeline out of the water. But So that's the evidence for, the, for, for, for hurting Russia. But what really this is, at the end of the day, is an attack on Germany, not Russia, because Russia's already found its own customers in India, in China, and elsewhere, in Iran and elsewhere. They're making trade deals to the South. They realize that the so-called West is hopeless. They're already making arrangements. They're building new pipelines in Siberia. This is an attack on Germany by the United States, in my opinion, uh, and it may well be a death blow to Germany. We also have to understand the political milieu in which this attack took place, because you see a coalition that was cobbled together in Europe, particularly uh, in, in, a, in a pretty sort of weak way. This was not, you know, the World War II coalition against the Nazis or whatever. This was pretty weak and it was already splintering. Uh, again, as we talked about b- before we were on camera, massive protests in Prague huge protests in Germany. Of course, the mainstream media is not covering these protests. Huge protests, and they're all saying the same thing. Open the pipeline, cancel the sanctions. We don't want to freeze. You can see it in any of the, excuse me, in any of the posters. And also Viktor Orban in Hungary, the prime minister, who has not been enthusiastic about these uh, sanctions, about shutting down the pipelines. He announced a couple of days, or right around the time of the explosions, then Hungary is actually going to hold a nationwide referendum on whether they think they should continue with sanctions against Russia. Because as he pointed out very correctly, these are sanctions against our own citizens. They're not sanctions against Russia. So you're seeing the political will to continue with this, let's strangle Russia. Uh, meanwhile, Russia is now you know record profits in exporting uh, energy. Let's strangle Russia until they you know basically cry uncle is, is backfiring. People are realizing that they're taking to the streets. Uh, we saw what happened in Italy, whether or not the person that is now going to be prime minister is going to change things is another story. Nevertheless, you see just below the surface, huge political rumblings. And again, as we talked about off camera, the snow hasn't really began falling in Europe, but it will. Well, I wonder if people understand that this isn't purely a Russian project. It's a consortium of sorts. It's a joint project. There's several European businesses and and economic concerns involved in the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which is something like an $11 billion project. So it's, it's not just, it's not only the Russians who are behind the pipeline itself as owners and operators. Yeah, that's right. And I, and again, just to underscore what Daniel was saying, this, that's why when I was earlier saying in terms of if if somebody were to do this and, and for let's suppose it were to be Russia for some reason, besides the silliness of just they could just stop putting the, the natural gas in on the loading end um, that you, if they were trying to show, hey, you mess with us, this is what's going to happen. These are some consequences short of us using our you know, nuclear arsenal. They would announce to the world they were doing it, whereas if the U.S. did it, they would have to be clandestine about it because again like you're saying it wouldn't just be aggression against you know the bad guy putin but it would also be the the european investors or whatever who are partly in on this project so that's that's what again th- obviously none of this proves it air shot air, uh, airtight case but it makes more sense that it would be the u.s rather than russia if those are the two people we're trying to say one of them did it can i just add something jeff to what bob sure. just said sure. which is an interesting point to ponder um, so this, the, the explosions, the attacks took place in, in an extremely sensitive area, very close to Danish um, uh, territorial waters. You had a Polish naval base very close by. This is the heart of NATO. So who else is going to get a black eye if the Russians did it? If, the, if NATO cannot protect vital infrastructure literally in its heart, in the Baltic Sea is the NATO Sea. It's referred to as the NATO Sea. If the Russians can sneak in and blow up this pipeline in the heart of NATO, 
which we're told we have got to continue to fund and support because it keeps us safe, if they failed in probably one of the most blatant challenges, easy to detect challenges they've ever faced, well, then people are going to start wondering, well, what good is NATO if they can't even stop the Russians from coming into the NATO Sea, i.e. the Baltic Sea, and blowing up pipelines and stuff? So there's something. I think there's something else to ponder in that. Well, Bob, I wonder, though, it, you know, we did a show a few weeks back with Alex Epstein on his new book, Fossil Future. And to me, that made the open and shut case that we are, we are either going to use fossil fuels in large amounts going forward in the West, or we are going to suffer a severe diminution in our economic and material well-being. I mean, that's that to me is the stark choice in front of us. And and so, yeah, there might be true believers in the in the Green New Deal in the Biden administration. But but Bob, on some level, the, Biden has to know that higher energy prices hurt him politically. I mean, why why? Even even if you're a believer in the Green New Deal, which I consider absolute fantasy pie in the sky, I mean, in the short term, doesn't this hurt Biden because there's still the the idea that Americans are going to have to feel it at the pump? Oh, yeah, I, I think so. And, and if, yeah, he recognizes that. And that's why, you know, they were re- making releases from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to bring and They were bragging about, look at how much we're bringing down prices and whatnot. And it's it was great. I was a lot of right wingers in the, you know, the U S politics were criticizing that. And sometimes I think it's just whatever the Democrats do, the Republicans just automatically say the opposite, even if once in a while the Democrats are right on something. So I said, no, 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 let's, let's frame this. They're admitting higher supplies lead to lower prices. Like that's, that's progress folks, you know, for yeah. the Democrats. So uh, I was glad at least to see that they know energy one one. Um, So yeah, that's, that's why they would do that because yes, people going into election, if, if they're paying too much at the pump, that they're not going to be happy and they instinctively say, okay, well, the people in charge, you know, that's, we're going to take it out on them. Let's get somebody else in there. So I think that they do realize that unfortunately, like in the, in the grander scheme though, when you were asking Daniel before, I'm concerned that the left will be able to successfully spin this to say, you see, it's too bad. We were, Germany was dependent on natural gas from Russia. If they had just gone green a decade earlier, then we wouldn't be in this mess. And so that's partly why I was emphasizing that, no, this was a full-blown energy crisis even before Putin had anything to do with Ukraine, that this was going on, you know, in the summer of uh, 2021 even, and, and so because of, lo- you know, lots of different things. But besides all that, too, there was a chilling effect. If you're thinking of developing a refinery or, or you know, certainly not going to build a coal plant in Germany, you know, when you, re- you know, see the writing on the wall in terms of their regulations and, and whatnot. So a lot of this stuff, yes, is the chickens coming home to roost from these allegedly green policies. And Putin is just a nice boogeyman to, to blame everything on. And, and again, the overarching thing here, too, is the, the Western nations have plenty of reserves if they would just be allowed to develop it. So that's partly what's going on. The reason Europe was so dependent on Russian exports is because lots of the other countries that have rich deposits, their governments weren't allowing for full development of them. Well, Daniel, are Americans suffering from Putin fatigue? Have we stopped caring about Ukraine and having little Ukrainian flags in our social media avatars, uh, especially with the election coming up with our own economic problems? I mean, are Americans starting to worry more about their own finances than than Putin and Ukraine? Well, it's going to be hard to justify when we've had a major hurricane in Florida and you're going to have billions of dollars worth of damage. The next time that, uh, that Biden wants to send another $10 billion to Ukraine, you're going to have, if the Republicans had any sense, which they don't, you're going to have an absolutely handy cudgel to beat him over the head with. Uh, why are you sending our money over there when people in Florida are, are like on their rooftops? That, you know, they can't, they have to like swim to the store or whatever, uh, you know? So, um, yeah, and I think there was a recent poll, I mentioned it on, on yesterday's show. And again, polls, you know, I like polls, especially when they agree with my position, <laughs> right? <laughs> so <laughs> Those are my favorite ones. polls. <laughs> best ones. So those are the ones I pick. But, but the Quincy Institute did a survey and they found that, um, 57% of Americans that they surveyed overall said they believe that the U.S. should help facilitate a diplomat or a negotiated solution to the Russia-Ukraine conflict, even if it means Ukraine needs to compromise. 57% is pretty significant. But among those 57% of voters, 62% of Democrats felt that way. So you're going to see the Democratic Party if, again, you know, this is a poll, but if that is true, if it reflects the uh, the, the, the mood of the people you're going to see the Democrat base 
starting to weak and starting to get uh, uh to get nervous about this ongoing us we're all in we're all in to win uh, particularly as you're seeing so many facts on the grounds now in eastern ukraine so i think it will become a political problem i think it's a political problem that's there for the republicans to exploit but i think the republicans are so mired in their own the old line republicans are so mired in their old ideology the cold war ideology that here's a low-hanging fruit right in front of them and they're afraid to grab it yeah but isn't that something uh, for example I mean, Trump understood war weariness. He understood the fatigue that the American electorate had with Iraq and Afghanistan and all the loss of life and limb. And, and you know, Tulsi understood that. And yet we've got these neocons running both parties. It, it's just almost unbelievable that they don't get as a political matter that people are sick of this. And, you know, did we ever get that... that WNBA player lady out of Russian jail. I mean, is she is she sort of a victim of this escalation escalating rhetoric against Putin? Is she still stuck over? The, I guess she had like a tiny bit of CBD oil or something. I mean, is she still in jail? I think it was actually um, stronger than CBD oil. I think it was hashish, if I'm not mistaken. Well, let, okay, oil. let's let her out. I mean, come on. I <laughs> yeah. mean, that's no, the, no, that, yeah, that's the kind of thing. Her. That's the kind of thing where you know this escalation with Putin. It makes an awful lot of neocons feel good, but they just seem clueless about the underlying politics. Well, she, I think she is a pawn, just like Maria Butina was in the U.S., if you remember. It's just this nice, hapless Russian gal who loves our Second Amendment, comes over here and gets in the NRA and loves guns and everything, and all of a sudden she's, she's arrested and put in jail for, what, a year or something uh, for being some kind of agent. So I think maybe the Russians are doing a tit-for-tat with this uh, – this basketball player that there certainly could be that that politics is not is not is not out of the question. But yeah, she's still she's still hanging around in a Russian jail, as far as I know. Well, Bob, I I wanted to bring up. There's this great section towards the end of Human Action, uh, at least well, not the very end, but the end the end of Part Six. Uh, Mises has this this short ten or twenty pages, which he calls the Economics of War, mm -hmm. and he goes through all these ways in which this is really an ideological problem and you're always going to have stronger and weaker nations and that only laissez-faire can create, laissez-faire domestically can create the conditions for peace abroad, which I think is a very important point. But one, one thing he, he points out, and again, he's writing this, you know, in the mi middle of the 20th century, is that um, these conflagrations tend to create the conditions where people demand more autarky. And we, we see a little bit of that here at home. We say, well, you know, we shouldn't be so reliant on Middle East oil. We should have our own, uh, you know, we should be energy independent. And that's a form of autarky or autarkic thinking in a sense. And, and again, if we consider, uh, you know, the Biden administration or neoconservatives or, or whoever, you know, the you know, globalists generally, these are people who, who aren't, don't much love the nation state as the unit of organization or the unit of analysis. They don't much love oil and natural gas as the drivers of our economic engines. And yet these, these wars, which they're pushing, um, seem to me to be creating the conditions that give rise to like this new prime minister in Italy, uh, you know, the, po the populist Trump revolution, um, you know, opposition to the Green New Deal and, and climate change, uh, uber alles, because people want to have, you know, buck 95 gas like they had during Trump. So it seems in a sense, if we think that they're purposefully creating a crisis, they're doing it inartfully because it's, it feels like it's backfiring. Yeah, a lot of different um, elements involved in this sort of thing. So, yeah, just to underscore, too, what you guys were, we were talking about, the neocons, it's so in economics, there's this famous phrase that there was this paper called Baptists and Bootleggers to say back during alcohol prohibition in the 20s in the United States, there was a coalition between like the preachers who were just against alcohol for you know religious reasons or social reform. And then the bootleggers, of course, liked the prohibition because then it raised prices, black market prices, and they were doing well. So they were they were for it. So likewise, like coming to the like the invasion of Iraq, the standard critique like from a leftist is, oh yeah, the imperialists just wanted to steal the Iraqis' oil, and maybe in the long run, in terms of multinational companies getting involved or whatever. But in the short term, what would happen is when the U.S. goes over the Middle East and metals, that 
restricts the flow, you know, either because things are just war torn or there's sanctions or whatnot. And that raises the global price. So the U.S. owners of natural gas and crude oil deposits, they benefit from the higher prices. And so, like, so likewise here, the, like a huge windfall is accruing to the U.S. owners of natural gas. So the neocon, you know, theorists who want to just you know, have moving chess pieces around the board and they like global intrigue and politics, they have their own reasons for supporting foreign policy intervention in the Middle East and, you know, Russia and so forth. But they're also backed up by people who just for purely economic reasons that it's good for them if you knock out a bunch of your competitors for two years or something. So there's all that going on. And, and yeah, it's it's true that uh, these things lead to people wanting to have autarky. But again, it's it's a strange thing. It's really not a critique of free trade per se, because the reason the U.S. is or Germany and so forth, they are so dependent on these exports is that the governments are not practicing free trade at home. If again, if, if there were open markets, if, if the U.S. Uh, companies could develop domestic resources, this wouldn't be an issue in the first place. So it, it is as usual, like when intervention causes problems, people find a way to blame it on the free market. And, and so yeah, you have this that recurring cycle. Well, Daniel, I'll give you the last word. You know, the neocons present themselves as real politic, as the realists. Uh, we need peace through strength. We need the United States as the hegemon and, and the example for the world. We can't have a multipolar world. Uh, here, here's what Mises says. He says, modern civilization is a product of the philosophy of laissez-faire. It cannot be preserved under the ideology of government omnipotence. So how, how do these neocons get away with year after year, you know, claiming power in the in the foreign policy apparatus, regardless of what regardless of what parties in power, um, when when we know in fact everything they promote just just leads to instability and war. Well, they have taken over both parties, and obviously Victoria Newland is as much of a neocon uh, as any as anyone on the on the Republican side. You know, they don't. In fact, she worked for Dick Cheney, right? That's how it works. And now she's Biden's top person on Europe. Joy. That's how it works. So, um, I mean, they, you know, the, the Wolfowitz doctrine is already dead. It just doesn't know it yet. I mean, it's de facto dead because, you know, uh, you're talking earlier about um, about dollar hegemony, you know, that's gone now. Uh, and the thing is, what killed it is that it was tested. You know, it's like, um, it's like when you have a diplomatic passport, the last thing you want to do is get into trouble and test whether it works, you know. And um, so that's that's what's happened already. What I sort of worry more about is what comes next in a way, because they can still do a lot of damage. However, <coughs> excuse me, and you mentioned it when you talk about the rise of autarkacy, autarky, you're seeing kind of a rise of a nationalism, like you say. And I worry that a new right is rising in the U.S. that's, that's very much nationalistic. You talk about national conservatism. They're starting to blame a lot of things on us libertarians that are not our faults, <clears throat> particularly in the realm of economy and foreign policy. And I think that's a danger for us, <coughs> excuse me, to look out for in the future. The rise of uh, the reaction uh, to the action of the neocons is not necessarily um, breaking in our favor, I don't think. Well, we got to wrap it up, folks, but I think we have a lot of under 40 ideologues uh, running around the Biden administration, uh, running around the EU, uh, you know, MEPs in the European Parliament who don't understand that this isn't a game, uh, that this has very real effects on people's lives, that we're not going to be so, e you know, e we're not going to so easily just transfer over to so-called renewable sources of energy, and that a wider war with Russia between European, NATO, U.S. forces, and Russia is a very, very, very bad idea. So if nothing else, uh, let's do our best to make sure that our leaders know that. Thanks very much, Daniel and Bob, and everybody have a great weekend. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. And in the meantime, you can find more content like this at Mises.org.